Let me begin by um, thanking all the gentlemen, gentlemen on the stage um, for being here um, to honor the memory of Mr. Tarkunde. Um, I am personally very grateful indeed for having been asked to deliver this lecture and uh, to remember once again the greatness of people like Mr. Tarkunde. It is indeed an immense honor for me to have been invited to speak in memory of Mr. Tarkunde because he was without doubt amongst the strongest pillars of civil rights and democracy that we have seen in recent years. If we survive the present as a democracy, it will be because people like him and the values that he gave to our society. Mrs. Al Kunde had a long association with MN Roy as well as the Indian radical humanist movement and later with establishing the People's Union for Civil Liberties. That was when I came to know him, when he was both a mentor to me as well as a neighbor. He lived two doors down. Uh, which meant, of course, that I was in his house, in and out, having endless conversations about what was going on. And in fact, I have the feeling now, when I look back on those conversations, that he was just the kind of person who would have given us the strength and the confidence uh, to survive had he been alive today. And it is therefore a privilege for me to dedicate what I have to say to his memory. All this, and more so, because we are also remembering today the ghastly act of the 6th of December, 1992, mm. when the Barbary Masjid was willfully torn down, stone by stone. Through this act, an important symbol of our civilization was reduced to rubble, and the rubble remains as a reminder. Let me now turn to the lecture. I shall be speaking this evening on a subject that was of general interest in the past. And although that general interest may have declined somewhat, the theme is of critical importance to the present. I'm referring to the right of the citizen to dissent as part of the right of free speech. The right to dissent has come to be recognized as such in modern times, but its actual practice goes back many centuries. And I am partly concerned with this practice of dissent in earlier periods. However much we may wish it, Indian society, as every other society, has not been a seamless, harmonious unity with little or no contradiction. As with others, we too had our share of intolerance and violence and the clash of ideas. Dissenting voices were many. They had a much wider articulation in the past than we like to recognize these days. Let me briefly clarify what I mean by dissent. It is, in essence, the disagreement that a person or persons may have with others, or, more publicly, with some of the institutions that govern our pattern of life. Earlier, only the elite had this right to dissent, but today it extends, in theory at least, to all citizens. In earlier times, the right was often argued about, but did not become a public issue to any very great extent. But in, implicit in having these rights is the exercising of dissent where thought appropriate. This has a historical continuity, even if its forms have changed. In historical terms, the social relationship of earlier times 
was encapsulated as that of the Lord and the subject. This has given way to a new construction in the form of the relationship between the citizen and the state. This historical change coincided with the emergence of industrialization, capitalism, through the evolving of the middle class controlling this new technology, and it was expressed in the new identities that came with the emergence of nationalism, a new feature altogether in historical terms. This phase marks an alteration of governance. Secular democracies replaced kingship. Representatives from all sections of society had rights of equal status. And this helps to integrate the secular, the democratic, and the national. In a true democracy, the right to dissent and the demand for social justice are core concepts. Since it includes all citizens, its inclusiveness requires it to be secular. In India, the overwhelming form of nationalism was anti-colonial nationalism, common to most erstwhile colonies. This implied the assertion of the free citizen ready to challenge political orthodoxies of various kinds. The construction of this identity recognizes that it is new. Nevertheless, it seeks legitimacy from the past. It's always being said, this happened in history. So, history becomes crucial. And as was common to most colonies, the colonial reading of the colony's earlier history contributed to formulating its identity. The colonial comprehension of India was founded on the two-nation theory. James Mill argued in 1818 that Indian history was essentially that of two nations, and he called them the Hindu and the Muslim, and that the two had been permanently hostile to each other. Colonial scholarship based itself on this idea and its implications. This theory was also loyally followed by both religious nationalisms, not by the anti-colonial nationalism, but by the religious nationalisms, both the Hindu and the Muslim. The concept of the Islamic State and of the Hindu Rashtra, uh, the latter based on the Hindutva version of history, are each rooted in the colonial understanding of Indian history. Each of the two religious nationalisms excluded the other, and each distanced itself from anti-colonial nationalism. Anti-colonial nationalism, however, saw India as a nation of citizens who, irrespective of origins and with a substantially similar identity, were all of equal status and were coming together in the demand for independence. It was all-inclusive, it was secular, in its demand for a democratic nation-state. It envisaged no primary or exclusive citizens, as in the case of the two religious nationalisms. Nationalism, if defined by a single identity, becomes majoritarian. Unlike the religious nationalisms, anti-colonial nationalism did not exclude dissent, neither in its own evolution nor in opposing colonial authority. Anti-colonial nationalism incorporated various forms of opposition to colonial rule. The most striking of these, perhaps, was the Satyagraha of Gandhi. It seems to me that echoes that it echoes in some ways the earlier historical concepts of dissent that surface at various times in Indian history. But my argument this evening is less concerned with Gandhi's use of these ideas in constructing Satyagraha and more with how they have been appropriated by the public and how they had been appropriated. 
What explains the overwhelming response to Gandhi's Satyagraha when he made the call for it? I would like to begin perhaps on a personal note by speaking about how my interest was aroused. There was one occasion a lifetime ago when I very briefly met Gandhi and exchanged half a sentence on a very simple, to me, mundane matter. In a curious way, it came to symbolize for me, however, the need to go beyond the obvious to search what, for what I often like to call the context of thought and action. I was in school in Pune in the early 1940s. Gandhi, when not in jail, would hold prayer meetings that we, as young, budding nationalists, made a point to attend. One evening, I took my autograph album to the meeting. We all had, in those days, school children had these little autograph albums. And with much trepidation, I requested Gandhi to sign it. Remember, there were no mobile phones, otherwise I would have asked for a selfie. <laughs> but he signed in the book, and when handing it back to me, he asked me, why was I wearing a silk salwar kameez? Adding that I should only wear khadi. I readily agreed and assured him that I would do so. But what did khadi mean, other than its being a kind of textile and in some way associated with Gandhi's ideas. This question remained unanswered until many years later, when searching for the context, the context, I began to comprehend the meaning of Satyagraha, and not just the concept, but how it became relevant to anti-colonial nationalism. Even more important for me was how and why did it resonate with the many who participated in the national movement. Without this resonance, it would have remained just a slogan. The events of the 1940s, the Quit India Movement and the mutiny of the Royal Indian Navy, <clears throat> had their own message. Independence was imminent and the future was enveloped in debate. How would a colony be transformed into a secular democracy? What was going to be our identity as Indians when we are, became free citizens? We would have a new relationship with the state, a state of our own making. And the constitution was, in a sense, the covenant between the citizen and the state, recording the rights and obligations of each. And hovering over all these questions were those concerning the methods that we had used to attain independence. What marked our movement as distinctive, it was said, was the concept of Satyagraha. Over the years, I have asked myself why this concept became such a bedrock, specifically in Indian anti-colonial nationalism. Predictably, it failed to find any place in the two religious nationalisms, the Hindu and the Muslim. These religious nationalisms converted the two religions into political agencies, the Muslim League supporting an Islamic state and the Hindutva version of Hinduism becoming the base for a Hindu Rasht. In the politics of these, these conversions of the religion, the chickens of the colonial interpretation of Indian history and culture came home to roost. To understand the context, I would like to go back a little in time and briefly trace the flow of some ideas that I regard as foundational to Indian civilization. These have a noticeable presence in Indian society for two millennia. millennia. And since religion has today become central to politics, I would like to look at the way in which we, in modern times, have given shape to our religions and how this actually differs from the past. <clears throat> 
In the last two centuries, Indian religions have been reconstructed largely along the lines suggested by colonial scholarship. This was seldom seriously challenged and therefore came to be accepted. The focus has been on belief, ritual and texts with little space for analyzing the reach of religion into society. What social forms did it create or endorse, any one of the religions? And how might these forms have differed from what was there before? When a religious teaching acquires a following, it establishes institutions that are initially places of worship. We know all about them, the chaityas, the viharas, the mandirs, the masjids, the gurdwaras, the churches, and so on. Monuments are not just architectural features, as we tend to treat them these days. They exercise control over those that use them as places of worship, and as institutions of socialization, bonding society to religious norms. At this point, ideological support or opposition becomes a matter of asserting dominion and domination. This can be met by acceptance from some, some and dissent and disagreement from others, sometimes becoming protest. Religions in India were generally not viewed traditionally as monolithic, and especially not so in practice. Religion was articulated more often in a form of a range of juxtaposed sects, some marginally linked with existing ones, others distant. In pre-modern times, the religion of a person was identified more often by sect and caste, and less frequently by an overarching label of Hindu or Muslim. Even in the last century, for example, not so many decades ago, we saw the birth of a new deity in Santoshima and a new sect following the Sai Baba. However, colonial perceptions of Indian religions projected a different form. Religious sects that seemed similar were bonded together under a few distinctive labels. Thus, the label of Hinduism included, apart from Vaishnavs, Shaivs, and Shaktas, almost all the others, such as Buddhists, Jains, Charvaks, Sikhs, the lot. These latter actually originated not from an agreement with the Hindu tradition, but in opposition to Hindu worship and belief. It's very interesting that in the 16th century, there is a very famous uh, uh, study made uh, by a, a, a very uh, enlightened Brahman, enlightened in many ways, Madhusudan Saraswati, uh, who refers to the Brahmins and the Hinduism of the Brahmins, and then he refers to the others, which he calls uh, Buddhist, Jain, Charvak, and Turushka. Turushka was a term that was used for Muslims. It was a term for the Turks that came from Central Asia. They never said Muslim, they said Turushka. And he describes these four as different from the Brahmanical sects because he says they are Nastika, they're non-believers, even though the Tarushkas believe in Allah, but they don't believe in the Vedic and the Puranic gods. Uh, and they're Mlech, they're all Mlech. So there is no way in which traditionally the Brahmins and these Mlech groups would have been bumped together, put together, and called by one label. However, colonial scholarship did that. Within the label, then, some sects contradicted each other's teachings and practice. The implications of this were ignored and uniformity was insisted on. The 19th century middle class interest in religion was largely confined to its own boundaries, virtually unconcerned with the religions of what we now call, for example, the lower castes, the scheduled castes, the scheduled tribes, the OBCs. 
Interest in the religion of these Avarnas, those outside caste, was casual and of little importance in the definition of either Hinduism or Islam. These were group, groups that were kept outside. Not recognizing the role of sects in each religion, the religion was treated as monolithic and uniform. Nor was it recognized that every religion has adherents, but it also has dissidents who question its belief and practice. Serious contradictions have been resolved at times only by changes in the code and the creed of the religion, and the changes come through pressures from dissidents. Despite this, religious persecution was practiced, but generally between the sects, as, for example, the vicious hostility between the Vaishnava Bairagis uh, ba 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 and the Shaiva Dashnamis, who actually even fought over the site at Ayodhya. Even now, dissenting opinions can evolve into marginal sects in the spectrum of religious sects. Sets shape the nature of, nature of Indian religions. Each religion is a collective of sects, some of which are proximate to orthodoxy and others far removed. Belief can be flexible and accommodating. Adherence to code and creed links religion to society in which caste plays a major role. And caste is an extremely important element of all Indian religions. For the larger number of people in the past, the sect was a legitimate religious identity. Hence, the easy mixing of religious observance among a range of people and a range of sects in earlier times when religious festivals were op open to everybody. This form militates against a unified, monolithic, overarching religious structure. Caste and religion had a presence in the making of a religious identity. Some degrees of dissent were always present in these sects, and dissent takes various forms. In philosophical argument, for example, dissenting opinions are necessary if theories are to be tested and advanced. You cannot advance a theory unless you question it. The presence of the dissent was acknowledged. In more sophisticated discussions, it had an assigned place in the argument. There was a recommended procedure, perhaps akin perhaps to legal procedures, certainly akin to some kind of dialectics. The argument has first to state, wherever a discussion is going on, the argument has first to state, as fully and correctly as possible, the views of the opponent, Purva Paksha, then follow the views of the proponent, Prati Paksha. And after this comes the debate between them, and a possible resolution or siddhanta. This would have been the pattern in the many debates between the Buddhists and the Brahmins that are constantly referred to in the texts. The presence of dissent in religion is equally clear. Mention is made since early times of dharma, but of two parallel and distinctive streams, that of the Brahmins and that of what is called the Shramans. The collective name of Shramanism has been given by us to those heterodox sects of the Buddhists, Jains, Ajivakas, and Charvak. These were the dissident sects whose teaching was in disagreement with Vedic Brahmanism and Puranic Hinduism. They denied the Vedic de deities they denied the divine revelation of Vedic texts and the ritual of sacrifice. And the Brahman texts refer to the Shramans as the Nastikas, the non-believers. The Shraman Dharmas gave substantial attention to social ethics, and this is a very important difference between the orthodoxy and the heterodoxy. This was expressed in their absolute commitment to ahimsa, non-violence, 
to compassion and to working towards the social good. Social ethics were not absent in Brahmanism, but became increasingly ambivalent with the influence of uh, caste laws, the dharma shastras that were constantly brought in. For the first few centuries up to the Christian era, Buddhist and Jain sects had a well-respected social presence and received royal and elite patronage. This, however, changed when in the post-Gupta period, about the 4th century AD onwards, Brahminism came to dominate the political scene. And by medieval times, Buddhism had been exiled from India, but had become a very powerful religion in other parts of Asia. Jainism was limited to Western India and parts of the peninsula. And by colonial times, almost all non-Muslim sects were labelled as Hindu, even those that were not. And this is one of the contradictions in the definition of Hinduism. The geographical identity mutated into a religious identity. The dissenting ideas of the Shramanas were expressed in part by their beliefs and practices that did not coincide with Brahmanism and by their pattern of life being alternate to that of the established society. And what do I mean by this? Monasteries enabled the alternate style of life. Mm -hmm. Monasteries did not exist before uh, these groups came into existence. Shramanas as renouncers should not be confused with ascetics. This confusion is often made. Gandhi is often <coughs> described as an ascetic. Uh, he really wasn't an ascetic. He was closer to the renouncers. The true ascetic, the sannyasin, performs his funeral rituals as a prelude to declaring himself dead to the family and social connections and goes away to live in solitude. Let me try and explain what I mean by renouncers. The two dharmas on the Indian landscape, starting from about the mid-first millennium BC, are described in the texts as those, as I've just said, of the Brahmins and the Shamans. These are the only two. You don't get any others referred to, only these two, and that's very interesting. This gave rise to major debates. Naturally, dualities always give, give rise to debates. The Greek visit to Ma a visitor to Maori in India at that time, Megasthenes, refers to the two as the Brahmanes and the Sarmanes. This is a Hellenized version. Um, the edicts of the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka have many references to what are called Bahmanam Samanam. It's the same thing, a compound term for the sects. And the grammarian of Sanskrit, Patanjali, very famous grammarian, when referring to dharma mentions only these two and compares their relationship to that between the snake and the mongoose. <coughs> They were the dominant two, with multiple sects not conforming to either. The early Puranic literature demonstrates the antagonism between the two in their hostile remarks on the shamans. In the 11th century AD, Al-Biruni, coming from Central Asia, describes the Brahman religion at length, which interestingly he kind of terms the Hindu religion, but not quite he mentions that those that oppose it are the Samaniyas. The second millennium AD witnessed the rise of a series of sects, the Bhakti sons of diverse Vaishnav and Shaiva and other persuasions. Many Sufi schools also were established at this time. Some supported the rulers, but many opposed them, as they also opposed the mullahs and the qazis who tried to whip them into silence. There was much exchange of belief and ideas between the bhakti sons and the Sufis, and their followers were a mix across the range of sects at shrines such as the famous Hinglaj and at khankas in the district of Multan and later the Doab. <coughs> 
Dissent did not lead only to founding renunciatory orders. It extended to discussing religion as an agency of social norms, which it is in every case in every religion. The dissent of the renouncers took diverse forms, some of which were continued by the Bhakti Saints. The views of Kabir, Dadu, Ravidas and others underlined again social ethics and questioned caste. We tend to set this aspect aside in our single-minded focus on religion alone. Historically, therefore, there was a continuing multiplicity in religious beliefs which some sects clearly uh, had dissenting views from those of the established ones. Renunciation, therefore, became a parallel stream to the orthodox ritual-based patterns of religion. Religious institutions mushroomed through the patronage of the elite. There were flourishing agraharas and mats, as well as temples richly endowed. And the Sufi khankas were equally impressive. Much of popular religion was propagated by bhakti and Sufi teachers. And folk literature and the poems and the myths on local deities, drawing from all religious traditions, are evidence of this. Renunciation and dissent take on something of what one might call a continuing counterculture from earlier times. The sects of renouncers were open to all. They often questioned the Dharma Shastra rules and the alternate society did not rise out of a violent social revolution, but it envisaged social change as coming from a process of osmosis. It was essentially a way of stating and legitimizing dissent by persuading people to its ways of thinking with an emphasis on social ethics and the freedom to choose whom anyone wished to worship. This freedom also imbued renouncers with a degree of moral authority and this moral authority was very important in the eyes of people at large. Social equality and justice were demands that were not readily supported by established religions, except occasionally in theory. But the act of renunciation also became an expression of dissent. The articulation of protest took diverse forms in different cultures and different societies. Unlike in China, where peasants, uh, where peasants, uh, peasant revolts of a violent kind were known, in India, peasant protest in earlier times resorted to migrating to a neighboring kingdom. We are told that kings feared such migrations since they resulted obviously in a loss of revenue. Urban protests took different forms. One of these was included, I believe, in the repertoire of Gandhi. It was known by various names, one among which was Dharna. Its success lay in its being undertaken by a particular body of people in a kingdom, people known as the Charan and the Bhart. These were the bards the ones who made up the epics and the poems. They were regarded as repositories of knowledge that was crucial to legitimizing the power of the ruler. This is another instance of people investing authority not in an officially designated person, like we do today, but someone viewed as respected and integral to society. Today, with social change, they do not perform their earlier functions, but recognizing their role gives a glimpse to us of how societies operated 200 years ago, or even 100 years ago, perhaps. Some activities of these bards were essential to power. Authority always needs legitimation. So the bards maintained the genealogies of the rulers and occasionally of the important functionaries through which they became 
the keepers of the history of the dynasty. They legitimize the dynasty through a claim to history, and the status of those in authority were asserted by the Charan through alluding to the believed historical evidence of clan and caste. The Charans themselves had a low status, but since early times they have been treated as inviolate and were called upon to arbitrate in disputes. Authority is, of course, of various kinds. In some situations, moral authority takes precedence over the political. It goes without, with the belief that a particular kind of person, being what he or she is and does, has moral authority. The Charan had it. He would take up the protest of the people once he was convinced of its legitimacy. And to support the protest, he would position himself at the threshold of the royal residence and go on a hunger strike until there was a resolution of the conflict. Or alternatively, the nearness of his death by voluntary starvation. The effectiveness of the fast was dependent on the person fasting being someone who commanded moral authority mm -hmm. and was respected by both the rulers and the subjects. His power was intangible, but based on this respect. His protest was legitimate, and if it focused on a demand for justice, if the Charan lost his life owing to the fast, the ruler was doomed. Thus, the moral threat posed by the fast was feared, and the dual purpose of the fast as dissent and moral threat was not unknown in the earlier forms of registering protest. The fast subsumed the protest and diverted it from becoming violent. Can one see in this some parallels to the use of the fast by Gandhi? The British Raj may not, have be, uh, may not have admitted it publicly, but each of his fasts was a matter of anxiety to their political control, he being the leading national figure. The title of Mahatma, in turn, recognized his moral authority with the people, the fast was a protest against injustice, but also carried a grave threat should it have taken its toll. This was understood by all. But let me turn to the implications of this activity. Dissent of various degrees was at the core of the renunciatory tradition. Can we then ask whether Gandhi's Satyagraha drew to some degree from this tradition, either consciously or subconsciously? But more central to my argument is that this feature probably encouraged the massive public response to Satyagraha. Is there a link between the essence of Shramana renunciation and the resonance of people to Gandhi's Satyagraha. His understanding of the concept drew from the authors he read and wrote about, who have been much discussed, Tolstoy, Thoreau, and Ruskin in particular. He had lengthy conversations with Rai Chand Bhai on the Jain religion, as he would have done with his mother and others in Gujarat. He read many texts of the Hindu sects as well. But my concern is more with trying to understand what it was that struck a public chord in this particular form of protest. His reading of the texts associated with Hinduism was of a different genre, as, for example, his careful reading of the Gita uh, and his attraction for Brahmacharya. Could the prevalence of alternative cultural patterns from the past have nudged him into a kind of instinctive response. The imprint may have been less apparent than we have realized. Did the form, uh, the form and the justification for Satyagraha reach out to a stronger tradition 
of the expression of dissent with a long history behind it. Some have argued that it was the ideal of Brahmacharya that he was emulating. But this is not borne out by dissent, uh, since it was not, in fact, based on dissent. It was quite acceptable to the orthodoxy. Dissent of the Satyagraha variety focused on the social ethic, not so much on the individual except for Gandhi himself. And we must remember that Satyagraha was primarily a political statement, mm -hmm. however it may have been presented. Parallels with renouncers are more noticeable in the making of the practitioner, the Satyagrahi. To be effective, a period of training was preferred, although there were some exceptions. There is some mention of taking vows, of consenting to observe certain rules. Once accepted, the discipline of living in the ashram was reasonably strict. Satyagraha was not a monastic order. Nevertheless, it had its own rules, relationships, and identity. To assert a greater moral force, it was preferable that the Satyagrahi be celibate, although this was not insisted upon. Protest included the non-violent Swadeshi movement. The boycott of foreign goods, especially cloth, was linked to industrialization in Britain. This was part of civil disobedience, with its much broader concerns. Objections to mill-made cloth and the wearing of khadi, this is where my own experience comes in, was not intended as a Luddite movement, but as registering another form of dissent and explaining why it was necessary. Some symbols of renunciation also surface. Underlying Satyagraha lay the force of moral authority, soul force, as he called it, of the person calling for civil disobedience. This, in a sense, echoed what also gave authority to renouncers of various kinds and in diverse ways. That Gandhi was named a Mahatma, an honor that interestingly he did not reject, was partly a recognition of his moral authority. A fundamental requirement of Satyagraha, and in fact also of the earlier Shramana religions, was to refrain completely from violence. Violence destroys moral authority. Ahimsa faced two kinds of opposition in the modern times, that of the colonial power and its continued violence against nationalist protesters, and that of some Indians in authority, some of whom doubted its effectiveness in directing protest. The commitment to nonviolence and truth also underlined the idea of tolerance. All religions were to be equally respected. This came from Satyagraha not having its own singular religious identity. Although one can say that one of the religions was perhaps more equal than the others. However, there was a moral right to break the law if it caused widespread suffering. But who had the right to judge? Was Gandhi assuming this right, strengthened by being called the Mahatma? The dilemma becomes more acute if one accepts what one may call the contingent ahimsa of the Gita, that where evil prevails, it can be fought with violence. This is not absolute violence, but it's contingent. Yet, the Satyagrahi tried to persuade the other to his view in non-violent ways and through a system where the means and the ends are not contradictory. A more complicated issue was present when Satyagraha was practiced in the larger social context. This involved the equality of all castes, uh, including the outcasts. Did the equal status of all castes as frequently, frequently maintained among dissenting sects apply both to the Varna and the Avarna members of society or only to the former. 
How was the hier hierarchy to be countered in practice? Gandhi tried, but to little effect. Many maintain that the actions of one's previous life determine one's birth in this life. But if actions are evaluated according to the Dharma Shastra codes, then the codes would first have to be discarded if the hierarchy is to be annulled. And few argued for this. The Shravana sects claimed that the monasteries did not observe caste. On a wider social scale, it was some of the bhakti sons who also opposed caste, particularly those who came from the lowest castes. For Gandhi, if the Varna caste began doing the demeaning jobs allotted to the Avarnas, the stigma might just be lessened or go. But caste by now had many other ramifications as well, unlike, and unlike the renouncer, the Satyagrahi did not necessarily discard his caste identity. The appeal of Satyagraha is evident from the large numbers that responded when the call was given for civil disobedience. We have to ask what went into the making of this form of defiance. Could there have been an echo of the persistence of dissent that still surfaced when injustice was experienced? It galvanized national sentiment, but it also diverted the sentiment away from violent revolution when it came to channeling it into protest. This was true to type, as such movements, even in the past, had steered away from violent revolution. In the colonial situation, Satyagraha forced both the protesters and the authority against whom they were protesting, be it of salt or be it cloth or the freedom of people, to give the protest visibility. It underlined a claim to status by the colonized by forefronting moral authority against colonial power. And this was outside the experience of the colonizer. Admittedly, Gandhi, in his readings, lists little that goes back to the texts of the Shamanas. His formal interest in such sources seems marginal, especially compared to his intensive study of the Bhagavad Gita. However, that Satyagraha could envelop dissent rather than violent protest suggests that these ideas did have a presence, however inaudible they may have been. One could ask whether Gandhi's endorsement of the Gita, Gita was a seeming contradiction of the insistence on non-violence in Satyagraha. The translation he chose to read frequently, apart from the Gujarati, was curiously the English translation by Edwin Arnold, The Song Celestial, published in 1885. The potential of the Gita to be the single sacred book of Hinduism, the equivalent of the Bible and of the Quran, was being discussed at this time. The Gita and the segments added to it are thought to date to around the turn of the Christian era. It surfaced in a big way in the 19th century and rode the European Orientalist wave that was searching for wisdom from the East. The Theosophists adopted it as their central text and gave it wide diffusion. Inevitably, many Indians wrote on it as a representative text. Some saw it as an allegory, and this ex excluded questions of historicity. William Butler Yeats, T.S. Eliot, Christa, Christopher Isherwood, all flirted with these ideas. Its appropriation by many nationalists was possibly because it could be used to endorse even violent political action as the duty of those fighting for rightful demands and justice. If colonial rule was evil, then violence against it was justified. What is perhaps curious is that the question of violence and political action should have drawn so heavily 
on the Gita. A more challenging text is the twelfth book of the Shanti Parvan of the Mahabharata that unambiguously focuses precisely on this subject. This segment of the epic is dated generally to the post-Mauryan period. <clears throat> We're told that subsequent to the battle at Kurukshetra, Yudhishthir was expected to take up kingship, but he initially absolutely refused to do so, preferring to retire to the forest. His objection to ruling was that kingship involves many levels of violence, and he was averse to these. He asked how any war can be called dharmic when it is the duty of some, such as the Kshatriyas, to kill others. His grandfather, Bhishma, still lying on a bed of arrows from the battle, justified such killing as the ruler needing to defend the realm. This conversation is a fine example of dissent explored through debate. Yudhishthir eventually agreed to be king, and I suspect with a rather heavy heart. Ahimsa as contingent would obviously be opposed by those for whom Ahimsa was absolute. Yudhishthir has a moral and ethical objection to violence. This debate reflected the discussions on violence at this time, enhanced perhaps by the views of the Emperor Ashoka in support of Ahimsa, as has been argued by a large number of scholars. Was the centrality of Ahimsa in this conversation a concession, a concession to shamanic thought? Unlike Nehru, Gandhi had a perfunctory interest in Buddhism, nor was he particularly interested in a sequential study of the past. History was perhaps not a subject of great intellectual interest for him. That there were occasions of violent and intolerant actions in our past is undeniable. That there were also legitimate traditions of non-violent dissent is also undeniable. The forms of the latter changed in conformity with a changing society, and we have to recognize the forms and how they were used and when. Gandhi created new forms of dissent. Yudhishthira's statement on political violence argued that when religious ideas and their implications become agencies of political mobilization, their fundamental purpose changes. The political determines thoughts and actions. The continuation of the right to dissent, to disagree, to debate, can be seen in the manner in which it has been formulated. And Satyagraha has been one effective form in recent times. In many ways, this is to conclude, in many ways the right to dissent has been highlighted by the coming of the nation state into our history. It calls for a new relationship involving the rights of the citizen and the obligations of the state. It remains open to the citizen, immersed in the ideology of secular democratic nationalism, to articulate this new relationship by reiterating the right to dissent. And it needs the state to acknowledge the validity of this right. Thank you.